Texas, I think, is a, is a, you know, we're a big state with a big reputation for a lot of things. Sometimes the reputation is deserved, sometimes it's not. Uh, so part of the reputation, uh, I think, for Texas is uh, that we are a limited government state, right? We like markets and competition. Uh, and particularly, I think that's uh, been true, especially when you're talking about the electricity sector and the power sector. Um, we'll hear uh, about that. Uh, we also have a reputation as a big energy state. That's also true. Uh, probably most of that reputation has to do with uh, oil and gas. You know, uh, I think uh, uh, on, the, on the Simpsons, you know, the Texas character is the guy with the big cowboy hat and the oil rigs. Um, and certainly uh, Texas has a lot of oil and gas resources. Uh, but we also have a lot of, uh, I think, uh, most wind in the country. We've got a lot of clean energy resources. A lot most nuclear power in the country too, I believe, uh, for the moment. Um, so what we'd like to talk about is, uh, and uh, the state's uh, power sector has cleaned up a lot in the last uh, couple of decades, right? Uh, not necessarily as a result of some huge deliberate uh, programming of that, but just through market forces and other things. So we'd like to delve into that. Uh, we're gonna have, I think, uh, I'd like to have a, you know, more of a conversational uh, approach as opposed to full panels, but I will introduce uh, uh, the panelists. So uh, beside me is uh, Cheryl Mealy, who is the Chief Operating Officer for the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, ERCOT. Uh, you'll hear more about ERCOT if you don't know it yet, but they're the, the grid manager for most of the state. Um, uh, beside her is uh, uh, Commissioner Ken Anderson, uh, former. former Commissioner. You, 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 you still get the honorary. Uh, uh, so Commissioner Anderson was uh, Commissioner on the state's Public Utility Commission, uh, which provides regulatory oversight and management for the, uh, not just electricity, but uh, this one area. It, uh, he was on the commission from uh, 2008 to 2017. Uh, so, you know, 2018 now, right? So it's a former. Um, uh, and then uh, moving down, uh, we have uh, Elizabeth Lippincott, who is the executive director of the Texas Clean Energy Coalition. She's one of the, actually, she's over there. Uh, Hello. Uh, that's right. Yeah, she's uh, dealing with the, the whole social company. media. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, they've done a lot of research uh, about what's been happening in the Texas uh, electrical market. And then. Uh, at the end, uh, we have uh, the Honorable Dale Ross, who is the mayor of Georgetown, Texas. Uh, Georgetown is uh, located north of Austin. It's one of the fastest growing uh, cities in the United States right now. Uh, and they have, uh, uh, I guess I would call it a technically nonpartisan uh mayoral office, but uh, the <coughs> candidates, you know, uh, uh, tend to be identified with the parties, and, and uh, Mayor Ross is, uh, I, I would say, uh, a Republican. I think it's not a secret. <laughs> 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 That's right, yeah. It's not a secret. Um, <laughs> not a secret. <laughs> not a secret. Um, well, it's not a secret. So, yeah, really. Cheryl, let's, to, to set the stage, let's talk, talk with you. So, uh, you know, for people who don't know, how does the Texas uh, electrical system operate? What is ERCOT? How does it operate? Um, and uh, uh, you know what's what's the deal there? Yeah, so I thought I that's a good place to start. Is you know what is ERCOT? What do we do? Well, ERCOT um, is, is the great operator in Texas, and that really is a result going back into the 1990s when the Texas Legislature and the PUC restructured the electricity system and the markets in uh, Texas to both the wholesale and retail markets and and regulated in ERCOT. Now, ERCOT is not the entire state of Texas. The big thing to is that we actually support about 24 million customers and cover about 90% of the load, electric load in Texas, and about 75% of the footprint. Um, so we're a nonprofit organization, and we are 
regulated by the, the Public Utility Commission, and certainly the legislature also occasionally gets involved in the oversight of what the market should look like. Uh, but we do have an independent, we have a board of directors of getting the top ladder queue back there, because we don't have mics. Uh, so we have a, a board of directors who actually is the direct organization itself, and that's made up of affiliate directors as well as the stakeholders. And it's the stakeholder body who really helps ERCOT and the protocols and the direction that ERCOT wants to entertain people when they need to. So we're also uniquely the only non FERC jurisdictional market, meaning that our energy market is fully governed by the Public Utility Commission of Texas and not FERC. Uh, although we do fall into the liability sectors for the uh, first program. Yeah, you more talk louder. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what does that mean we do? Well, we manage the flow of power across the electric grid, and that is connecting about 46,000 miles of transmission, 570 generators within the state. And that is our primary role, is to make sure that we schedule the power in ways that maintain reliability and that we are always looking at the efficient dispatch of those generating units. And so we're looking for the lowest cost solutions that still leads to reliability of the grid. We also settle that wholesale market, and we also are responsible to transition the retail customers to in the towards areas. There's about 7 million customers in those areas, and we're responsible to make sure that they very quickly get moved to their retail electric provider of their choice, and that, that all stays in the as well. So the other aspect of ERCOT that I think is always important for people to understand and talk about is the fact that we're an energy-only market. There's no capacity component, no capacity needs to go to the generators in our state. You're paid for the energy you produce, and you're paid for the ancillary services that you provide to support the reliability of the grid. And that uh, really is, I think, unique, and has always been the core principle of design in the ERCOT market. And while we change the features, and while we need to change that core principle of an energy so what has resulted from that kind of oversight with the, the Texas PNC having oversight and having that energy only market led to buy a really to really change the, the makeup of the resources that we have in Texas over the past 18 or 30 years. We've seen a significant increase in the amount of renewables. Last year alone, the energy produced for the market in Urquhart is about 17% renewable. The vast majority of that renewable energy comes from wind. We have about 39% of our production from natural gas, 32% from coal, and 11% is referenced. We still have a lot of nuclear in our state, and 11% of our energy is produced by the two nuclear plants that operate in the air cost of plants. So another unique thing, we still see growth. Not all areas of the country are experiencing less of growth, but in Texas we are still forecasting the air cost. We're still forecasting about 1.5% growth rate going forward. And looking backward, we've had about 2% per year, so we're seeing that slow down a little bit, but we are still seeing growth, and that's, that's a good thing for our market. That means there's more opportunity. Um, most of that demand is driven by hot Texas summers, as you can imagine. And coming into this summer, we do expect to set a new system peak. Uh, we set a peak last time in the summer months in August of 2016. But just looking at this past winter, we haven't been able to support reliability. We actually crashed through our all-time uh, winter record this year. Back in January, we, we had a peak of about 65,000 megawatts, and our prior peak back in 2017 for winter was about 59,000. So a significant growth continues to support uh, the ERCOT market. So what is, how have we gotten that renewable energy to the markets? Well, back in the earlier part of this decade, there was decisions made by the Texas legislature and the PUC to invest in transmission resources. So all of that wind was getting developed, but what we needed to do was make sure that it could get to the market so that that efficient, low-cost energy could serve the, uh, the centers that consume the energy in the state of Texas. And so we spent about $7 billion constructing transmission resources out in the western part of the state where the wind resources exist. As a result of that, we've seen consistently persistent low prices in the state. That combined with the low prices of natural gas and again persistent low price natural gas really drives the energy market in low cost. So there were, you know, the I think that was also alluded that Texas really hasn't had a lot of policy driving the development of renewable energy. Well, 
there was a renewable portfolio standard adopted in Texas. There was a goal of about 5,800 megawatts by 2015, 10,000 by 2025. Today we have over 20,000 megawatts of wind in our pot. So we've long since passed those standards, and it was really the opportunity that has uh, continued to have the resource developed in Texas, not necessarily in Texas. Um, what else have we done? Well, you can imagine the challenges of connecting that much renewable energy. So we've really had to have a lot of engineers thinking about how can we maintain this continued growth in renewables and support an efficient market while still making sure we've got reliability. And we did that through setting the right standards for frequency response, voltage and frequency drive through, voltage support, wind and for tail, and setting ramp rate limits that managed to support the grid reliability that customers expect. Ongoing efforts will continue as well. It's a, still is a big challenge to think about how to manage these resources as they grow in our footprint. So we've got a new desk in our control room, and our primary focus is really looking at what's going to forecast the next hour, the next day, and you know what is the gap between that forecast and what we're really seeing to make sure that we are managing that risk. Uh, you know, load is going up. If that resource suddenly falls off its forecast, we need to make sure that we've got the ancillary services online and ready to go to support that, that change. So I think the other big thing that's happened is, I mentioned low prices. Well, if there's low prices, that's great for consumers. And that certainly is the goal of the efficient market, is to have good prices for consumers. But on the other side of that is the generators. And the generators have had uh, several years now with low returns on their generation resources in our market. And so as a result, as a natural cycle, what we've seen is less efficient older plants start to retire. Primarily those have been coal resources here this year. We've lost about 4,300 megawatts of coal resource. And so our reserve picture is very different this year than it was last year. Last year we were talking about reserves arranging from 16 to 18 percent. Today we're forecasting that our five-year forecast, currently we have about 9.6 percent reserves. Over the next five years, we'll, we'll forecast it to about 11.9%, so a significant change in that outlook. So what does that mean for our market design? That means prices will rise. Consumers have had the benefits of low cost. Generators have suffered the consequence of low revenues. And so what we can expect and what we're seeing in our forward markets is a significantly higher cost. Um, you know, is that, is that risky? Is that a problem? We don't think so. We think it does require performance, though. And our market is made up of four segments. We've got generators. We've got all that transmission that we've invested in for reliability and economic reasons. We've got the retail electric providers offering various products and different types of products to the consumers in the competitive areas. And then we certainly have the consumers themselves. So we expect that if everybody does their job going forward with lower reserves, that reliability won't suffer. If consumers don't want to pay $9,000, which is our, cap, our market cap price, then they have the opportunities to look at how they're consuming. Uh, right after renewables, the next thing we're seeing in our marketplace is distributed type resources. And this summer, when we have higher prices, we expect that ERCOT, who's been focused on thinking about those distributed resources, is going to see what they can really do. Whether those are behind the meter on the consumer side or whether those are intentionally out there trying to play in the marketplace, we're going to see a lot of that distributed generation resource get deployed during scarcity conditions. So, you know, the good side of that is that they can help reliability if we know where they are and if they are responding to price. And so that is an area that we'll continue to study. But by and large, our energy-only market design has really resulted in efficient outcomes. It has caused older, less efficient resources to leave the market, and it's created opportunity for new technologies um, to participate in the market. And as we look forward, we expect that we're going to see more solar. Uh, kind of the next wave, we have about a thousand megawatts of utility still sold in Texas today. We expect that to grow. We still will see some wind development between now and when the production tax credits phase out uh, over the next year and a half, two years. And then we expect that we'll see new technologies. A lot of these distributed resources, rooftop solar, and the Public Utility Commission is also engaged in a rulemaking to look at what type of opportunity batteries should play in our market. But all of those things are up for discussion, and I think the rest of our panelists will provide a lot more insights into the excitement that uh, many of these changes have caused and the things we still need to think about in the ERCOT marketplace. So, uh, Commissioner Anderson, you 
uh, you know, let's talk about the, the political dimension of this, because there's two uh, things that I think are important for Texas. One is, you know, you, have, you uh, are able to adopt this system in the first place, uh, you know, 20, 20 years or so uh, now. And then, uh, but there's a second thing, which is you have to have the political discipline to maintain it, uh, come what may of the, you know, uh, various events. I know it was mentioned that Texas doesn't have a capacity market. I know there was a, there was a, uh, a push or a controversy about whether uh, a few years ago we should adopt one. Uh, by and large, uh, my impression would be that uh, over time, Texas not only maintained the political discipline in keeping the competitive market in place, it's actually become uh, even even more market oriented uh, as it's gone, gone along. So it, talk about that. As a, as a former regulator, uh, uh, you know, wh what is your perspective on, on all of that? You know, first, a little history, I think, is important, and and that is understand really how this got started. And it, it was a, I think, unique set of circumstances in the late 80s and early 90s where you had, in the 80s, uh, a bloodbath you see over uh, what at that time was new uh, both in North Texas, the big units, and then uh, down outside of Houston, South Texas, South Texas projects, as well as a new plant out in, in Arizona that was um, that a big piece of it was owned by by one of our Frederick Co. Integrated Utilities outside of our kind of house electric. And ultimately, you know, they went bankrupt over the cost and the disallowances uh, that they were made, they were made by, the, by the PUC. Uh, that all led in the early 90s, along with the fact that this was sort of, you know, I hate to call it a fad because that, uh, that minimizes the importance but there was a train of thought that was moving through the country that uh, uh, the deregulation of the power and breaking up and breaking up monopoly is a good thing. Uh, long and short of it is, in a bipartisan effort in the 90s, in 1995, you had the legislature deregulate the wholesale market. Well, again, the process of deregulating it. Uh, they also created the, the open access transmission system so it could be independently managed. And then in 1999, uh, they went they went all in, you know, and passed the, the major restructuring bill, again on a bipartisan basis. In fact, the two co sponsors in the Senate, I think you had a Republican senator who was the, the lead, and in the House, it was Democratic state rep. And again, it was supported by, although you know, not without a lot of compromises in the process, it was supported really by everybody, almost everybody. Um, utilities wanted it because they had, you know, they saw the growth coming in Texas, and they just couldn't face the prospect of going to the PUC on every power plant that they would build, you know, getting. Um, Getting a prudence review and cost and the and the write off. Uh, on the consumer side, there was there was concern, and then there were some things in the bill, including the renewable portfolio standard, that uh, they got the environmental stuff. And so you fast forward, uh, you know, restructuring went live on January in January 2001. Uh, the evolution of our market has been an evolution. Uh, there were obviously you know, feeding, you know, pain in the early years. Um, it, was, it was a big step. Uh, but the overall, the legislature and the political leadership, you know, they stuck with it. And I think in part because it was bipartisan, uh, we also had, back then, you made well, some of you are too young to remember. But in the first half, in the middle part of the last decade, you had gas prices explode. This is this is before fracking really, really exploded. But 
<coughs> at one point, I think gas prices got up to 14. And uh, uh, but as a result of the competitive market that was still that was still evolving, uh, while while gas prices uh, went to 14, you saw retail prices only go up about half as much. And so what you saw is. Is, the, is, is that the retail market and competition kept the lid on the prices and suppressed margins in order to not to lose customers in the park. Uh, but it, but it, there was pain, uh, uh, no question about it. The most important attributes of our market and what's important, I think, I'll, I'll just touch on very briefly, is the fact that the legislature uh, and the PUC at that time you know, they learned from the mistakes that were made in other markets. They went full unbundling, meaning that there was complete restructuring. The uh, you know, generation it was completely separated from the remaining regulated utility, which were the wires and poles, the FedEx, if you will, the system, the delivery, the delivery system, as well as the customer serving entities, the load, the load serving entities, they're called, the retail electric providers and the competitors. Um, and there, uh, there couldn't be any cross subsidization, you know, back with the wires and poles, because the wires and poles, those entities remain the only regulated, the only rate regulated in the market. Utilities were also taken out of the customer service and billing. Uh, you know, legally, the utility or the customer, you know, the customer of the um, you know, the utility is actually the load serving entity. In Texas, the retail electric provider or the city or, or whoever, if you're a distribution deal. Uh, um, they're the customer of the transmission system, not the individual, individual consumer. And so again, we, as part of it, was one of the really smart moves. We empowered customers, but at the same time, we, we also made them responsibility or responsible for making, you know, their choices. You know, just like a cell phone or any other phone. Um, uh, no default service, unlike in some of the other markets. Uh, and so as a result of, of a lot of this, over the last 17 years, you know, Norcott has has evolved, has evolved in the most competitive, I think, successful power market in the world. Uh, we often got got visited by, you know, folks from other countries who want to know how you make this work. Uh, and of course, I always say, well, it's really good regulation. <laughs> but uh, the key attributes in this thing is at the foundation, the energy only market, uh, which, which exposes to uh, both, both generators as well as load serving entities. Uh, with the risk of high prices, um, because of the, of the of the open nature of the market, we have over 1,800 market participants who daily buy, sell, and trade power, you know, both at ERCOT itself and in the secondary markets. Actually, the secondary markets probably have more you know, more participants. Uh, and in fact, ERCOT, the ERCOT North in the North Hub price zone, uh, generally is considered the most liquid. You know all the power market, you know trading uh, in the country. Um, that so that the first is the energy only market that we maintain. Uh, the second is just the the volume of market participants, uh, which also means that no side of the trade has really undue power or influence over prices. And then, and then as part of that uh, energy-only market, and it's one of the, uh, the proper or the, the improvements we continue to, to make over the years, we've introduced, we've introduced scarcity pricing mechanisms to ensure uh, that, um, uh, so that when ERCOT, or, or to attempt to ensure that when ERCOT uh, deploys power you know, for reliability purposes, um, it doesn't it doesn't result in price suppression. 
In fact, I just noticed today at the commission meeting, uh, I noticed in the trade press that <coughs> the commission has gone ahead and decided to you know, back the uh, both RMR and uh, Van Rock's reliability unit commitments out of the uh, formula. I won't bore you with the details. If any of you have questions, I can talk to you about it after afterwards. Um, the the second or, or the third is that that we do not have a capacity construct. Um, you know, unlike most of the other or all the other organized markets, at least in, in this country, uh, we have no mandatory minimum reserve margin. We believe in economically optimal reserve margin. Uh, when the market began, and it's still technically in any place, but there was a target reserve margin, but it didn't have any consequences other than to say, oh my God, if we're, if we're falling below it, that's a problem, without anybody really getting to the issue of, really, is it? And I can talk about that later if you have questions. Uh, the, uh, later this year, ERCOT will formally move or drop the, uh, the target reserve margin and, and just begin publishing every couple of years uh, the economically optimal reserve margin at the time and the uh, expected unserved energy, uh, what, what the consequence of the then uh, reserve margin would be economically optimal. Uh, the economically optimal, if you're wondering what does that mean, that means the, uh, the point at which the the cost to procure you know, additional capacity will exceed the cost that's imposed on consumers as a whole in the market. Uh, and that, at the heart, was the debate over, over reserve markets. And whether we've just been lucky or not, um, partly it was built in February of 2011, if you don't even remember that. We had a uh, first really statewide hard freeze in almost 20 years. Um, uh, we had a, we actually had a fat, a very fat reserve margin. I think over 16 percent. Um, if if my memory uh, memory serves me, yet for a variety of reasons, mostly due to poor performance on generators' part, we had over a third of the fleet either trip off or fail to start or just didn't perform. Um, we had rolling blackouts for about uh, about six hours, as I recall. Uh, uh, but again, w w whenever ERCOT, and, and at least in my memory, ERCOT's only had that happen twice. Once was 2016, and again, we had fat reserve margin, but it was the wind suddenly <coughs> dropped off in West Texas. At the same time, it was record heat uh, in, in April. And the spring is when most of the generators go down for their planned maintenance, getting ready for the summer. So anyway, um, in prices, and then, as luck would have it, the Cisquan offer cap had just, on the 1st of February, gone, gone from $1,000 to $3,000. Uh, uh, because we had gone to a low market, uh, LP market dispatch, uh, preceding December. Of course, initially there was all sort of what's going on here, what's going on here, what's going on here. Uh, there must be there must be there must be manipulation by generators, withholding that kind of thing. Well, uh, we jumped Barry Smith and our chairman. We jumped on it very quickly. Uh, we had the independent market monitor examine it, but more importantly, um, very quickly after that, those those two or three days of cold weather and very high prices big generators, and by the way, it was across the fleet. It was it was investor-owned plants, it was public power entities. Um, one of the largest generators in Texas had to file an 8K where they announced uh, they had lost $30 million in one day, <coughs> pre-tax, uh, because of the unit trips. And without boring with the details, one of the benefits of our energy on the market that would be suppressed in the capacity mechanism is that it forces both generators and load to pay attention. You know, generators, they learned a hard lesson that 
they better be available to run because if they, either because they have a bilateral contract or because they bid into the market day ahead, they have an obligation then to be online the next, that day. And if they don't, what happens, Burkhoff settles, goes and buys in the market the power to cover their position. Well, if they had sold that power day ahead at $90 and prices were $3,000, that, that's a big hit to the generator. Same thing on the load side. Uh, the energy only market requires uh, the retail electric providers, the cities, the public power entities, but the head to think about making sure that they manage uh, their consumption uh, or that they bought power forward bilaterally. About 90% of power in ERCOT, even though it's traded at ERCOT, but about 90% is actually bought and sold and traded with bilateral contracts and other hedging mechanisms that settle out the, the volatility. But if they don't cover their, if they don't have those, those hedges, those contracts in place, the shortfall, again, ERCOT will buy that power on their behalf and bill them you know, for the excess. Uh, again, that, that, that uh, behavior or that, that incentive has been very therapeutic because it has driven um, a lot of behavior we can talk about during the course of the conversation. Uh, th then finally, the open access regime. It's the final foundation piece of, of the ERCOT market. The fact that uh, the ERCOT is the operator, no matter who owns the wires and poles, um, uh, we have a very, we have a very strict, you know, non-discrimination. Anybody can access it, and also, and this is a this is a topic of some uh, some controversy, but the, the consumers pay for the grid. It's treated as a highway system in order to benefit the market. Uh, uh, every customer, every load serving entity, you know, pays their their load ratio share of the trans of the cost of the transmission system. Um, generators don't have to pay that access grid. In most other parts of the country, or in many parts of the country, if if you want to connect, whether a generator or or for that matter a consumer. Uh, you have to go get a study done, and then you have to pay the cost of the upgrades in order to get your quote firm service. That, that everybody has firm service in ERCOT. You just have to manage your risk of congestion. If you're a, again, if you're a, a, a generator or a, or a consumer, but but the the backbone itself is a highway <coughs> that anybody can use and, and access, and that helps actually the generation. So we've invested. My back in the envelope was. North of, 12, I think this is overly conservative. I think over 12 billion since 1999 on, on transmission. Um, how much? Yeah, because Chris alone. Yeah, we can come back. Well, I think yeah. the, the one final piece then is to talk about the environmental benefits that were not the intent of the, of the, of the system, but I think it's important to. I think Elizabeth, I think, might. Yeah, so anyway, I look forward to come back and talk about it after we got in a little bit. But so, uh, Elizabeth, so, you know, uh, Herbert Hayek, the uh, famous economist, uh, said, you know, one of the key areas of economics is studying things that are the result of human action but not human design, right? Things happen uh, in, a system, in a market system that someone didn't initially plan to happen, right? Uh, but they can be very beneficial to uh, society and humanity anyway. I, so uh, I would say that if you look at you know the move towards uh, competitive markets in Texas and the, the market design, uh, I would submit that was probably not done with the goal of you know encouraging uh, renewable energy or trying to get the grid cleaned up. Uh, overall, you do have, you know, you do have, there were a couple things in there like the, the, the renewable portfolio standard, uh, I guess, uh, which for the record, our street does not support. I, I was denounced this morning uh, selling out my principles for moderating this panel because uh, the invite mentioned the RPS, but different people have different perspectives on that. Uh, but that, I would say, is a, it's a minor part of the overall system. Uh, so, you know, it, you've, you've, 
you guys have done a lot of research looking at that. Uh, what have the environmental effects of competition been? Uh, and how has that shaped out? What, how has that worked? Uh, <coughs> Well, that's a really good question, and that's a question that we set out to, to try to start getting some answers to a few years ago. Um, so, as Josiah mentioned earlier, I'm with the Texas Clean Energy Coalition, and uh, we very much appreciate the R Street Institute and the American Conservative um, helping us uh, bring this discussion to Washington today. Um, we have been um, working in Texas um, on clean energy issues from a center-right perspective uh, since we were formally launched in 2011. And a few years ago when there was a lot of discussion about the clean power plan and how that was going to impact uh, you know, a whole array of, of activities in the energy sector around the country, um, we set out to try to figure out what the impact was going to be for Texas. Um, and initially Really, the question that we started out with was, as Josiah mentioned, um, you know, what what are the trends in the electric grid in Texas, and and what's going to be what's going to be the delta between where those trends are taking us and what this new um, controversial regulation, if it were to come into effect, what that's going to require. What's the delta between those two lines, and. Um, to our, uh, frankly, to our surprise and, and uh, somewhat to our delight, um, the, the research found that market forces, just, just pure economics 101 price competition, primarily from sustained low natural gas prices, as Cheryl mentioned, um, but also from, um, from solar technology that was very quickly becoming a lot more price competitive and then the sustained participation of the of the wind power sector uh, in Texas, going back you know over the last 20 years, that those forces alone um, were carrying the Texas electric grid um, on trends that would you know if if the CPP had been implemented, um, Texas uh, carbon emissions were already on track to outpace the requirements in the CPP. For the next 20 years, um, and you know that's why, you know sometimes that's why you do research because um, sometimes you find out, you know you find out that the answer is is frankly more interesting than what you thought it was going to be. Um, and we work with for all of our research, we work with um, an outfit called the Brattle Group, which some of you may be familiar with. They do a lot of research around the country and certainly in Texas with our Public Utility Commission and with ERCOT. Um, on uh, the economics of, of energy markets and a, a variety of other things, um, and all of those um, all of those studies, if if y'all are interested, um, are on the Texas Clean Energy website. And hopefully, you all got or you can get uh, when we're finished. Uh, there's just a one pager out there that's got some information about what TCEC does um, and has our our website on there, so you can go look. All of the studies are under our original research tabs. Um, so anyway, um, the this research that we did really um, really illuminated for us um, the very uh, healthy effects of market competition um, in the in the electric grid in Texas, and a lot of the policy choices that Cheryl and um, uh, Commissioner Anderson have talked about really have set have set the table for this. Um, Commissioner Anderson, you used the, the example of, um, of a highway. Um, you know, and we all know that the, that the, um, the interstate system, when it was constructed back in the, in the mid 20th century, it, um, it created a conduit for tremendous economic activity that benefited this country in a, in a myriad of ways. And a lot of the policy choices that Cheryl and Commissioner Anderson have talked about like the very bold choice to deregulate the electric market in Texas um, about 20 years ago, um, to go with an initial renewable portfolio standard that, uh, that wind development, pardon the pun, blew right by um, within a very few years. Um, and uh, under leadership from folks like Commissioner Anderson and others, the choice more recently to stay with an open competitive energy market in Texas 
um, even when there was, was renewed discussion about changing and going back to a more managed market, um, the choice to stay the course of an open market-driven electric market has really set the table for what we're now seeing, which is a very market-driven, price competition-driven transition away from older, um, you know, less efficient, less clean technologies and toward um, uh, much cleaner, more efficient technologies and, and beneficially technologies that produce power right here in the U.S. So as, as I think everyone in this room is aware, we've got tremendous <coughs> abundance of natural gas for, for the foreseeable future. Um, that will uh, maintain, uh, you know, very sustained, affordable prices for natural gas. Uh, the price of solar technology continues to drop. Wind technology continues to be competitive. Um, you know, storage battery technology, um, you know, everybody thinks is sort of the next factor that's going to get introduced into this equation. So, um, so the outlook for continued um, you know, continued, reliable, affordable, clean energy um, is very, you know, it's, it's, it's very bright and it has a, a number of good benefits, including reducing carbon em emissions because as, as Mayor Ross and I and, and some of our colleagues were talking about this morning, everybody wants clean air and clean water. That's, that's an American goal. That's not a partisan goal for anybody. Um, so, we felt, we, Clean Energy Coalition, R Street, other folks that, um, that we work with in our stakeholder group, we wanted to bring this discussion to D.C. because obviously there are, you know, there are a lot of ideas percolating um, about energy markets and the electric grid and, and what the role of government, uh, what it is, what it ought to be in, in electric and energy markets. And, and we wanted to share uh, some of these lessons from the Texas uh, experience over the last 20 years uh, with, with you and, and with your colleagues here on Capitol Hill um, to really to, to open up this discussion about a very, a very market-driven approach. Um, you know, that's, that's certainly the way that, um, that, that most leaders in Texas prefer to do our business. Um, and, and making, making initial choices, as Josiah mentioned, that set the table for the market to be able to work over a much longer term and take into account, um, you know, uh, evolutions in technology, um, evolving needs of customers as, uh, you know, as those trends become apparent. A lot of the things that we're seeing now and frankly that we're benefiting from were, I do not think were envisioned in the mid-90s or only in a very conceptual way. But by, by creating open markets and, and allowing them to work even when, um, even when it's not necessarily the, maybe the easiest or doesn't feel like the safest thing, but allowing those markets to work can, um, just like with the interstate system, it can, it can unleash tremendous economic activity and, and tends to drive, in the, in the case of electric grids, tends to drive the electric market toward cheaper, more efficient, uh, and, and cleaner technologies that benefit everybody. Um, so thank you, thank you all very much for being here, and we're, we're very glad to be able to have this discussion with you. Thanks, Josiah. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, see you down there at the end, Heidi. Uh, so, uh, Georgetown, I think, uh, uh, among its many claims of fame. It's a nice place. I used to live there. It's a very nice place uh, uh, to live. Uh, and uh, you got, I think, uh, a, a lot of attention uh, recently over now it's plans to move to a 100% renewable uh, energy or electricity or whatever. Uh, and I think, um, uh, so it's just, you know, kind of two questions about that. One, a lot of people think about that and they think, well, you know, wind and solar; those are intermittent resources. How do you? How does that work? How do you get? How is that possible? You can get 100 uh, percent. And then, uh, also, you know, why? Why do you view that as uh, uh, as important? You know, what what is it uh, that, that, that led you to try and uh, adopt that? And and what what are your next plans? 
Yeah. Yeah, well, it's an honor to be here, and thank you all for coming. Georgetown's about 30 miles north of Austin. You live in Austin. I do now. And we yes. love having you all as a suburb of Georgetown. We, <laughs> we, we use your amenities. South by Southwest is going on next week. We're going to go down there, spend a little money, and then come back to normality in Georgetown, Texas. We've been a work in progress for 170 years. Um, did you go to school at UT? Uh, I did, yeah. Okay. Well, back, we had the oldest chartered university in Texas Southwestern, and the last time that little college from Austin with the little Longhorns came and took on the mighty Pirates in 1946. You want to know what the score was? We kicked y'all about 7-0, and y'all haven't been back since 1946. I mean, it's okay? And the tech, you know, tech of football in Texas is pretty big. What we decided back in 2008, we gave we have our own city-owned utility. It's not a mono technically it's not a monopoly, but it's pretty close to being a mon monopoly. So we had a great deal of flexibility. We had a contract with LCRA in 2008. We the mission that we gave our utility director was by the year 2030, we wanted 30% of our energy portfolio to be renewable. And two, four, 2014 came along, we saw an opportunity in the market. We broke our contract, we wrote a big check to LCRA, and then we, we had two missions, and these were the two goals. One is to mitigate, minimize volatility in the pricing market, okay, number one, because we talk about in the future you think prices are going to go up, and you'll see that's irrelevant to us in Georgetown. The second thing is to mitigate or, or minimize regulatory and governmental risk. Anytime either whether it's a state legislature or the federal legislature, they put on additional conditions and terms for producing energy, it typically drives the cost up. We signed a 30 year, we signed a 25 year and 20 year contracts with Wonder and Solar. These are fixed price contracts, there are no COLAs, there are no increases. We know exactly what we're paying per kilowatt in, through uh, 2036 and through 2041. Okay, so uh, there's, no, there's no price escalations, we know exactly. And why is this important? Well, the last three years, the city of Georgetown has been the, the, the uh, second fastest growing, first fastest growing, and now the fifth fastest growing city in the United States for cities between 50 and 100,000. So the contracts that we sign take us to the year 2028. So we have a little bit more time to work on what are we going to do after that as we continue to grow. And if you look at uh, the, the central Texas region, out of the 11 fastest growing cities in the United States, five of them are in our region. It has to do with I-35 cutting right through the middle there. And um, it's, you know, it's a wonderful place to, to live and do business. I am not a subject matter expert. I can just tell the Georgetown story. We have people on staff that really get down in the weeds with this stuff, and they know all this stuff. All I know is this, is, you know, if you win the economic argument by default, you're going to win the environmental argument. When we did this, we put silly national partisan politics to the side. We based our decisions based on facts. Okay? And those facts led us to renewable energy was the best course of action for our city. It creates certainty uh, for the next 20, 25 years. Uh, and, and what we're seeing now is the benefits of the environment. And we have gotten tremendous media coverage worldwide. Um, well, I was in three movies last year. Short and Fat was in in 2017, okay? <laughs> we were in From the Ashes, which was Bloomberg and National Geographic. We were in Al Gore's movie. I guess I'm a Republican. That's okay. It's okay <laughs> to play with Democrats. Democrats are nice people, too. And then in December, uh, Robert Redford son, Jamie Redford, did Happening, a Green Energy Revolution. And what I learned from that, two things. One is we just keep talking about wind and solar. You also have hydro. And hydro is very environmentally friendly as well. If you look in Oregon and Washington State, and that is absolutely a sustainable resource. What I think the future is going to hold, I believe, and I may not be around, I believe we're going to have somewhere around 80 percent of the electricity generated in the in the, in the country uh, by 2045. What's going to happen is you don't even have to be an economist to figure this out. Four coal plants in Texas closed in January. That's 6,000 megawatts of energy that's taken off the grid. If you look at the prices right now, you've got wind and solar about 18 and 20. You've got fossil, I mean, you've got natural gas, I think, about 23. And you've got coal at 25. Every president since Ronald Reagan has been talking about we're going to do clean coal. There is no such thing as clean coal. That's a political thing when they run for president. 
the scrubbers that you would have to pay on there would make the cost even more cost prohibitive. I think what you're seeing in Texas is economic Darwinism. Okay, this is a battle for survival, and it's all being driven by cost. Those that are efficient in producing costs, and when you look at wind, you, you have a turbine, right? It cranks. You have maintenance on it every month. What else do you have? If you look at coal, it's very labor intensive. Then I'm going to be able to come. When the President Trump says, I am going to bring those coal jobs back, no, you're not. As many people today, today is the maximum amount of people that you're going to have in the coal industry. And you're going to continue to see coal plants close as we get forward. It's going to be economically <laughs> unfeasible, I think, to continue for coal to compete with fossil fuel, which we're blessed, God bless Texas, with a lot of natural gas and wind and solar. Currently, we're number one in wind production, and we're number five in solar, and in five years, we'll probably be number one in both. So the opportunity is, if we could, transmit electricity easily across state lines, we would be on the frontier of, um, uh, of something really huge for the economy of Texas, which is already pretty strong. And so that's what we're doing. We did it. First of all, it was based on economics, and now you can, we didn't count on all the free advertising. Our media people tell us uh, just $20 million in free advertising alone just on video, and if you do the print publications, there's probably another 20, and that doesn't include three movies. So. And today. <laughs> but, you know, but see, the people in Georgetown say, quit doing that because we don't want anybody here. So we're not going to We got ours. You go get yours later. So we're not going to build a wall. We're going to build a moat. And then the drawbridge. So, so you just, you know, can't come in. But we are. We're going to continue to grow. If you look at our economic development pipeline uh, over the next five years, we have a half a billion dollars worth of development. That's a growth rate of 7 to 8%, which is sustainable over the next four to five years. And thank you for South by Southwest. I will be there next week um, and down there. I'll spend a little money in your city, and then I'll go back home to, to the greatest city on planet Earth, which is Georgetown, <laughs> Texas. Thank you all for having me today. Yeah, so there's, there's one downside, I think, to your moat plan, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, which is in Texas we have drought sometime. The, the moat dry up. Well, Lake Georgetown was going dry, and I promised the citizens of Georgetown if they elected me, I would fill Lake Georgetown back up. We're, we we had to we had to drain some lake because we had so much rain in the fall. <laughs> Just if I could just jump yeah, in on, on sure, one thing, on the price issue. So um, uh, this was actually one of the factors that our research looked at uh, when we were looking at the, at the market-driven trends in the electric market in Texas. And, and definitely, I think, I think all of us anticipate with some tightening in the, in the Texas electric grid this summer, and you know, Texas summers are always hot, we don't know if this one's going to be hotter than normal or, or what, but um, uh, I think everybody anticipates that there will be, um, you know, there'll be some price signals that that the time is is here or the time is coming very soon um, to build some more uh, some more generation, maybe some more combined cycle natural gas um, to co that can be complementary with uh, with the renewable resources. But overall, over you know over a ten or twenty year time horizon, um, primarily because of just the very you know the, the sustained low prices from the three fuels that we're really talking about, and not to leave out hydro, but but really looking at at natural gas, solar, and and wind technology, you know those prices are are low, and the renewables continue to drop in terms of technology costs. Overall, that's going to hold wholesale electric prices very, very flat. I mean, definitely, you know, we can see, um, you know, we can see some some price signals being sent in the market. But you know, we all remember from economics 101 that you know that incentivizes new generation to come in, and the prices will again stabilize. So in the in the Brattle research that that we've done, um, their outlook is for wholesale electric prices. Um, that those will really remain flat. Um, you know, uh, inflation will do what it does. Transmission costs will do what they do. But with the growth of more distributed um, generation, where either through solar or as as battery storage comes more into the picture, as you put more of your more of your generation closer to the neighborhoods or the businesses that need that power 
you don't have to send the power as far and your transmission costs decrease, decrease. So we'll see, um, but, uh, but our outlook is, um, is very stable as, as far as prices um, for the, at the wholesale level. And you know, one of, the, one of the things that we're doing in Georgetown too is uh, we applied for a grant from Bloomberg and we got, we were one of 31 cities, Austin also got $100,000 and now we go for the million dollar and five million dollar grant. And the, the grant was to test a theory, and this is our theory, talking about threats to, to the grid or threats to our, our sources of electricity. One of the things we're, we're concerned about is if the grid got closed down or things got altered, or if the federal government came in and did something stupid, then like that's never happened before, but I mean, it could happen. And, but what we're thinking is, we're gonna do that, we're gonna test this theory. What if the city of Georgetown put solar panels, and we rented out from your home or your business and put solar panels, created a microgrid within the city and then still used ERCOT to, um, to draw energy from when we needed it. And what if we, gave, we even became more self-sustaining, uh, although in Texas, I mean, I think one of the things that, that, that's so successful is this free market. You know, economic competition, I think, makes everybody better, and it really rewards the consumer. And I think that's what we're seeing in Texas. I think there's other states, and especially the federal government, could probably learn from that model. The, the other piece uh, of the market that is, well, by having as competitive a market as we have, that incents innovation, uh, We've seen, again, after, after 2011, when a lot of folks got, got surprised, even before then, with higher gas prices in, in 2007, 2008, when they peaked before, before cratering. Um, on the demand side, on the low side, on the consumer side, that the uh, various uh, groups that are exposed to wholesale prices uh, and learn some really, really hard lessons really hard lessons. In 2011, by the way, we had the, one of the coldest Februarys on record. At the same time, that summer was <coughs> one of the hottest summer, I think second hottest summer uh, in the history of the state. So uh, there were some load serving entities who thought they were fully hedged, turned out they weren't, and lost a lot of money. What happened? In a, in a very short time, you saw load serving entities, the larger ones first, but it's it's spreading out there. Um, in order to compete with customers, they, they start offering things like, uh, well, if you sign a two-year contract in a fixed rate, we'll give you a Nest thermostat. Right. Oh, and oh, by the way, if you get a Nest, a Nest thermostat, <coughs> then you have the option of participating in our a demand response program. Uh, you don't have to do anything. We'll control it for you. Maybe and, explain what a Nest thermostat is. Oh, well, I think, you know, it's that, it's a remotely programmed, well, I ripped mine out of my apartment because <laughs> the battery went dead, but, but, but it's a, it communicates uh, through Wi-Fi uh, and can be used to set up aggregations of customers. Um, they, and so this one large retailer that lost a lot of money in August 2011, within a year or two, were, they were offering, uh, you had different reps offering, but the prices they offered ranged from 50 cents a kilowatt to almost a dollar a kilowatt for the net reductions when when you were called upon. Um, and you could also override it, but then they measured, they had algorithms which would measure the reduction. Keep in mind, this is at a time when, well, for example, in Dallas, um, our, all in, our current all-in fixed rate contract, including delivery charges, I think is 7.5 cents, all-in. Uh, and I pay more because because I hedge. I'm on a fixed rate contract. It was a two-year contract. Um, uh, but but when you get when you sign a fixed rate contract, that's a hedge. You're hedging. No, <coughs> it's not it's really no different fundamentally than what Georgetown has done or something else. Um, like with your mortgage, right? of course, more. So so what we ha have seen increasingly, and ARCOT is just now trying to get their head around it is these aggregations of customers, in some cases large industrials, in some cases they're cities that do it. Uh, Austin does it. I think San Antonio really does it. And they're both 
uh, municipal utilities, not competitive, uh, but they're participants in the, in the market, they are able to, when prices get at a certain point, they can reduce their consumption and they sell that power back into the market and they can pocket the difference. And, uh, and, and so that's one thing that's evolving. I, I think Brattle estimated there was 1,600 megawatts, you know, privately, some folks at ERCOT think it's well over 2,000. ERCOT has not published the number because they, their granularity, <coughs> first off, they're very conservative. But their, their granularity on this is they're, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to, they don't want to publish a number unless they're drop dead confident on it. But that, in the space of three or four or five years, that, uh, that explosion on the, uh, on the consumer side of participating by saying, well, you know what, and it's through the load circuit entity, saying, you know what, we had to buy this much power at this much price, but if we can drop our, our consumption by just two, three, four, five percent and sell that excess back in to the real-time market, uh, we make, they make money. It also reduces consumption and avoids uh, peak. It also helps to mitigate prices. Um, the other side of it on the demand side, which again on the distribution system, is the explosion of what I'll call utility scale, uh, uh, DER, DER, whatever you want to call it. I know at least one company that has two different programs. One is they themselves have gone around and put on the distribution system almost 200 megawatts, maybe more now, of gas-fired or oil-fired generators that are in, in, um, in trailers. They tap into the distribution system, and then they participate in various ERCOT programs. They also partner with large companies like Walmart uh, or, or others that are on the distribution system and face all the outages that, 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 that happen due to mechanics or storms. But they also participate in the ERCOT market. The company gets reliability, but they can also say, look, at, at certain times, we, we're going to turn this stuff on. You're going to drop off you, large big box store or whatever, or small manufacturing. You drop <coughs> off the grid, and we share in the profit that you make by selling, in effect, the power you bought back into the market. That is a huge development that uh, we're, we're just in the beginning stages, but it's going to have a profound impact. I'll tell you what, Elizabeth hit on something that was, I think, is going to be a game changer too, is, you know, renewable energy is a fungible good. You either use it or lose it, right? What if, I mean, with Elon Musk uh, and battery technology, what if you perfect that and the excess capacity that you generate today doesn't, um, it goes to a battery and then the next morning you use that? that would change everything. And then couple that with being able to ship electricity across state lines, this would be a completely different world if those two things happen. And they'll probably happen in y'all's lifetime, the battery technology. Oh, it's, lots it, oh, it's just Oh, it's just like the computers back in the 90s where the capacity was doubling every 18 months and the price was being cut in half. You're gonna see the same thing with battery technology. You're seeing that in electric cars right now, okay? And there's a big push by 2020 because that's when all the, the, the mileage is really kicks up and you have to do that or pay pretty stiff penalties as a car manufacturer. I've got an electric motorcycle. <laughs> I've got the only BMW in the state of Texas. So, um, it's just possible. I mean, the battery, I mean, I can go 85 miles an hour and, without police escort. And, um, and, um, but no, everything, every, I, think, I think the revolution is on batteries. And once the batteries get there, because there's nothing really fancy about wind turbines. I mean, the wind turbines and the energies, the solar panels is a different deal because, you know, the technology on that. Uh, the, the biggest threat, too, though, is, I mean, President Trump putting more and more tariffs on the Chinese for their solar panels, which is going to increase. Um, our solar farm, by the way, will be open probably in May or June. It's going to be way up there near Fort Stockton. Um, you can't really fly there. You're going to have to drive because there's no airport within 200 miles of Fort Stockton. I will say though, it'll be a lot, it'll be a hard it'll be a hard sell at the commission to ever allow interstate interstate well, sales no, like that. that. No, I agree. I agree with that. With that comes federal jurisdiction. Right. Had we been under FERC, and that's not criticism of FERC, but had we been under FERC, 
none of the stuff we've talked about today would have happened. Very little of it. Um, U.S. wind developers, why do they why do they pay taxes? They can go anywhere where there's wind. They go, well, your access to your grid in your market. That, that's what makes the difference. That and the fact that they can build very quickly because we're used to putting in infrastructure. You know, y'all got an energy secretary up here from Texas, Rick Perry. He's got the worst public relation people I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Without him and his leadership, we wouldn't probably have the grid and we wouldn't have renewable energy, probably. And he's running away from like that's a bad thing. Man, if I, I'd be out there saying, well, look what all he did for Texas in his 14 years as governor. But maybe that's because he reports to a guy that's not really um, a renewable energy fan. That could have a little bit to do. But again, politics instead of fact based decision making, it's not a good thing. There's a lot of good things, if I could just add a few things before July and probably wraps up here fairly soon. But I think the key things for you to be hearing about these, what's happening in the future, important things to think about is that our, our market has created that opportunity, right? People have wanted to come build that. We in Texas, they could have built it any place because of open access. But I think it's also um, important to think about what other things are developing kind of below the radar in Texas because of that market and because of that willingness to have price uh, drive both performance and uh, demand awareness is that we are seeing this distributed generation take off. And it's not because of policy or mandate, but it's because of an open market that provides that opportunity, provides the consumer the choice to really evaluate their business need for reliability, combined with their business opportunity of reducing their fixed cost. Because energy is really one of those things that affects the fixed cost, whether it's the grocery store, or the bank, or the you know convenience store, those are the types of customers that really recognize the value of reliability and the importance of them being in service. And so they've looked at these new opportunities for distributed resource to be there as a partner during times of recent events like Hurricane Harvey. And some of these stores were able to stay open. This summer, some of those stores are going to benefit because they have found this partner who has created an innovative product that can work in our market. To, to the advantage of both parties. For the grid operator, it's really important that we start to understand those dynamics because the other risk that we have is we don't have price, proper price formation and that disadvantages our large generators because that market does depend on that, that natural gas um, combined cycle plant or those quick start turbines. We have to have those in our market. It's great to think about the wind and the solar, but I also need something that can ramp quick and be dispatched. And so it's important to remember that everybody still plays a role in this, got the success of reliability in the market. That our market has provided that opportunity. And we just need to make sure that it stays transparent and fair. And so having some visibility into these new entrants is going to be an important thing that we're going to have to work through with stakeholders to make sure that generators also get uh, the price that they deserve for being there to support the reliability of the grid. And so that's kind of the next chapter, I think, of what we're going to see happening. And how does that battery play in? It may not be on kind of the arbitrage of, you know, price. It may be that the real value they can provide to our market is in their ramp potential. Because if you're sitting there with 54% wind, they can, unfortunately, as Commissioner Anderson reminded us, at one time in the spring, it dropped off like that from thousands to, you know, 200. And so we need the types of resources that can respond to that. Because we all enjoy the clean air and the clean water, but we also enjoy reliability and we expect it. And as consumers, we want to have the choice, hopefully, to get out of the way of high prices or have planned a way to stay out of the way of those high prices rather than have to go into the rolling blackouts. And so we want to make sure everybody can stay in business, provide the service that they need. And as the grid operator, those are really important parts. And we appreciate that our commission has been committed to constantly evolving that market making sure that we're not too static, but we're also not changing too quickly, because it's important for people to see that regulatory certainty, and having that local to Texas regulatory certainty really has been a benefit of the ERCOT market. All right, well, thank you everybody for coming. I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, but uh, we covered a lot of ground.